Welcome! This is Unfolding, the show where I talk to creative business minds. My name is Marco Pfann and today we are back at Territory Studios and we are talking to David Sheldon Hicks. We are back at Territory and this time in their new building, which is amazing and I'm gonna cut in some, some B-roll material. But today we are talking to David Sheldon Hicks about creative leadership and how a building like this actually frames the conversation on creativity, but also like his journey on how he grew his company from, I think you started out in your bedroom with three people and now you're more than 200 people globally. So tell me, what was, what was the biggest challenge in accomplishing all of that? Oh, I, so, um, and it's, it's really terrible because you just think, well, they're all listening to you now, aren't they? They're all gonna, they're all gonna pick this apart. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the, I, I think that, um, us doing a good job of telling them actually what's going on at any one time and, and feeling cohesive. So when you, when you first start up a creative studio, you know, there's a couple of you, yeah. and you're just friends, and you're kind of having informal chats. And then, so this is me charting through my head the different offices we've been to. So we were in a little muse, like, roof room, and there was, like, three founders and a couple of freelance motion designers, and it all felt, like, very friendly and friends doing work together and just a general energetic vibe. Then we moved to just down the road from here, Berry Street, and that was probably space for about 30 And it was all still open plan. So you still got the vibe and the energy and the culture was just kind of shared because everyone was around it. And I remember in the mornings, it was it felt like it was really buzzing. Like you'd get this real yeah. sense of like, okay, we're getting into our day. The briefs are coming through. We're talking about projects. You could still yeah. hear the different projects going on. You could hear the different mm -hmm. conversations. And they'd be hearing things that I'd be saying to my business partner or another creative director or whatever it was. And so the shared culture and the shared vibe at that point in that physical space was really easy and was kind of palpable. Like it felt like, you know, we talk here a lot about um, we're more a, of a jazz band than we are of an orchestra, which is there's an amount of instinct, instinct playing into the way that we work mm -hmm. and we're adapting teams all the time and bespoke to um, create a, uh, an ideal solution for a project it might be a bit of tech, it might be a bit of storytelling, it might be a bit of design and strategy and whatever else. So you, so you build teams around a project need. So in a space of about 30, that's really quite easy to achieve. To like to have the conversations and everyone knows. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Then we moved to Great Sutton Street, again, just down the road, stay, staying in Clark One in London. And that was when it was a space that was ready for about... 70 to 80. Was that the, the place I... Yes. The last time? So that was the last interview. Um, and beautiful building, split over four or five floors. So we had about 15 to 20 people per floor. Now, in that respect, it's good because you kind of get um, kind of cultures forming on each floor, but you're not getting the shared culture for the entire studio so That's much. So how do, you, how do you start to create that? And you think... You know, you do joined up events where everyone kind of comes together, starting to use things like Slack more often. So, you know, kind of like things going online the whole time. So when the pandemic kicked in, we were already using Slack. So there was already a bit of glue in there to mm -hmm. kind of help us have joined up shared conversations. And also, as San Francisco really started to grow and have its own voice, how do we become more joined up with them? Now, I... In my mind right now, and in fact, I'm I'm meeting with um, the team, uh, Stephen Sean from Cantina this evening, um, just to catch up with them. And the thing on my mind is, now we've got more global offices, we've got more teams of a certain size. Some of them are called Territory, some of them are called Cantina. Mm -hmm. They're all all under this Territory Group banner. And how how we how we keeping that all kind of consistent and. And in some ways, and I, so just so the, like my admission, yeah. and we don't have this all figured out because, you know, as a as a leader, you kind of don't know what you don't know. So you're you're trying to find the solutions, and you're working with everyone else to figure those out, and you try little things, and you see what starts to work, and then you kind of build on that. So I think the 
going to your original question, I think the biggest thing on my mind at the moment is how do, how much do we look at the integration of it all and how much do we celebrate the individuality of it? And when we set up the San Francisco office, Marty came, from, you know, travelled over from London. He went over and joined Lanell, who was more of a, a, a local producer at the time. She understood San Francisco, the place and the market, and Marty really understood territory and the brand and the kind of the creative calibre. And those two things coming together were a really wonderful kind of um, collection of ideas and processes. And getting people together is, was kind of... Shared knowledge. shared knowledge. Yeah, shared knowledge. And I think Slack and email, you can do some of that, but just every once in a while, just physically coming together. You know, and that's why we've got, you know, um, Sean and Steve here kind of like spending some days with everyone and, and just, yeah, kind of key meetings around, you know, what are we missing? Where haven't we? I mean, it's gone, it's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful joining of two teams, but we all wait. Creators like to make things better, don't they? they all, we're all looking for improvements. Yes. And, I, and I know there's lots of things that we're not doing yet um, that we could do better. So you just said when the pandemic kicked in. So and in terms of culture, like we were, switching, we're moving to culture now. Um, what? How does that change? And especially when it comes to the creative process, like can you keep up the, the quality of work or how did you actually try to manage that? Because now people are not together anymore, right? It's like um, we talked about like, Everyone knows everything and then people get influences from other people and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not settled on a, a solid idea on that. And I don't think, but I, and I think that's a problem. I think having not a solid stance on when people should come in and be together and when actually remote kind of works, you, you do need to be confident with that. And I think you do need to, to lay a stance. Yeah. Is, that, is that the sort of the question that you're asking, yeah, really? Yeah, so my question is, is there, I mean... Remote work has its advantages, obviously, but as a creative, I, I wouldn't want to sit at home all the time. So, what's the, what's the point here with with your people? Do they still come in? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. I mean, so so some days are yeah. I mean, we've got um, we're in our bright new shiny offices in London, um, and we're in our biggest screening room uh, today, which I'm very excited about. Um, we. We know that physical space is part of our identity. Ah, like it, yes. it, it, you know, my mindset changes. When I'm in here, I work very differently to when I'm sat in my spare bedroom. So that's actually the, the whole building here, which and territory is like, it's a name in the name too. If, yeah, I mean, if you truly believe in the power of design and brand, why wouldn't that continue on in the clothes that you wear, yes. the things that you use? the space that you're in. We all as creatives subscribe to that idea that design has an impact on us. It influences us. It influences our mindset. So we're promoting that idea to our clients. So we have to then, then believe in that for ourselves. So I do believe that environment designed for yeah. working, coming together, working on projects, solving them, um, I think I think that's a big part of it. So I I, I, th I think it's about mindset, collective mindset. It's what you're talking about. Our, our San Francisco team are just about to move to a brand new offices, and it's beautiful, it's really really beautiful. But it, it it reinforces the idea that we believe in the power of design. We yeah. believe in the power of considered, articulated, great creative, and the the space is an expression of that as is our branding, as is our website, as is the work that we put out, as is the way that we behave. Mm -hmm. So, and we, we tell our clients this day in, day out. So yeah. we have to, we have to um, practice what we preach to a certain degree, but it's also important to have balance in our lives. We've all kind of, we're all kind of acknowledging that. I think one of the things that I didn't expect, I think a lot of people talk about productivity. Um, the problem with the idea of creative and productivity, especially in, say, if you're working on After Effects or Cinema 4D or whatever it is, is you can absolutely, you're productive for an entire eight to ten hours of the day, however long you're working, 
and you're doing something, you get to the end of the day, you share that, and you just found out you've been productive on the wrong thing. Oh, yeah. Because you haven't, you haven't been part of that team and that collective conversation that comes from being in a shared workspace. So I think, I think when you start to think about it as an individual, I think the, I think the kind of the, the working from home thing works really well. When you start to think about your impact on the business, your ability to mentor others, or your ability to be trained by others, or learning softer mm -hmm. skills from here, overhearing a conversation, um, I think those things are real. And it's very hard because as a business owner, everyone looks at me and goes, hey, you, you would say that because you spent a load of money on an expensive yes. building and you just want you want me to be in. And blah, blah, blah. So I can't say those things out loud. I just have on camera, but I shouldn't. Um, but I think I think there's truth in that. Like, I love being at home. We just, I, you know, we've just shared photographs of our children and it's yeah. like, I'm a human being. I love being around my family. But... I'm also doing this because I'm passionate about the work. I'm passionate about doing excellent, excellent creative. And I am seeing that 100% remote, you know, just to kind of define that, I think has an impact on the ability for creative teams to execute on projects that are bigger than them. I think if you're doing projects as an individual, smaller projects that are contained, I've got no real argument there. Um, you know, if you're a developer building and designing a website by yourself, I think those people have often always worked from home, you know, um, in isolation. And there's definitely certain character traits that need need that bubble around them. And I and I, I respect that. There's also people that are trying to to balance with um, caring needs. Like I, I I get all of those things. And this open discussion around the need for this flexibility is a really valid one. I just think that um, as a studio that's promoting the idea of multiple creatives, technicians, engineers coming to deliver, to deliver on projects that are bigger than them, um, it's, it's hard to argue against coming together on site in, in, in considered ways for a project. It's, it's, um, I don't think the productivity argument stacks up. Um, and and the the work life balance thing absolutely stacks up. And if I wasn't talking to an audience of really impassioned creatives that really care about the quality of the work, I'd just let it go. But I know my audience yeah. is a whole load of the people that want to do work than they used to do. So settling is not part of their DNA. And I'm not just talking about territory, I'm talking about the creative community at large. People don't want to repeat themselves. No. And they can't anymore because AI has just turned up. So if you genuinely want to do original work that still has value, I think you need to be investing in your career, coming back in, learning from people that know about you, and not, look at, not just looking at, well, my net income is that much better because I'm not commuting now. Yeah. Take the longer sure. view, think about your career, and um, back yourself. Because I, I think I think people are looking at the short-term financial side of things. It's very easy for me to say in my position. I'll say that with my hands in the air. But um, yeah, you should back yourself and and just think about your career and what you're getting from it. Well, I love what great point you just made. And what I haven't heard before is actually people grow in this environment. Like it, it's really hard to grow at home. Yes, you can uh, refine your technical skills and all that, but it's like you can't grow as a creative if you don't have people around. This is not going to happen over Slack. Yeah. I've really screwed up lately. I've done a number of things where I haven't been there for my team. Mm -hmm. Now, that's happening because I've been on lots of video calls. I'm hiding myself away from problems or, or and I'm not being visible to my team. So I'm definite, I, I say all of this stuff out loud, almost criticizing myself. Um, I de you know, and, and I think, and you can only grow, you can only grow by acknowledging. Yes. How you're limiting yourself and then being open to that change. Um, and I've just gone through one of those moments. It's like, ah, oh, I needed to be there more for the team. I needed to be around things. And do you know what? As I think as a leader, I, and it sounds weird saying that out loud, but I think as a creative leader, I think you get so much learning from your team. Mm -hmm. Like going through the work with people, seeing the work happening, 
it just reignites my passion for it. It's like, this is why I'm doing it. I want great people to be on great projects. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. It's like, if this place can't deliver on that hope. And when I was a kid, I wanted to know that there was places like this that I could go and get a job yeah. and 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 realize, you know, my dream of of working on films or working on like cool digital creative stuff. Like we owe it to the that next generations coming through to still have wonderful places to work at. And I worry about, you know, the next 16-year-old kid and what she's going to want from a working environment is not going to be Zoom calls all day long. That's no, not going to be useful no to her. No one wants it. Right. And it's, I just came in the, into this new building here. It's amazing. Like you come in and it's like, it's, it's, it's like a frame, right? You come in and you have a different mindset. It's like, okay, I'm here to create something. It's just open, it's wide, it's all, everything is wide and you have... Yeah, this space was a real balancing act because we wanted a space that said to the territory team that had built it, and they have, there's a lot of them now, and mm -hmm. they've built this. You've created this. Like, this is freaking amazing. This building represents what you've been building. So it needed to say that. It needed to be not too corporate, but it did need to feel professional. It needed to say, this is a step change for us. We are wanting to indicate to the world that we've, we've grown a level. Mm -hmm. And um, I think... Creatives have this, I'm not logical, approach sometimes. Um, they have this thought around, I'm not business minded. I can't deal with the numbers. Yeah. I can't have like a, a big strategic or corporate conversation with. And I think that's unfair. I think we shackle ourselves sometimes with not taking responsibility for the harder business side. But design and creativity have a massive impact or and have the potential to have a massive impact on big brands and big projects and big conversations, big ideas, mm -hmm. really big ideas. And and we sometimes I think are quite childlike in our self confidence around some of those things. Yeah. And I think we have a, a a duty to um be a little bit more grown up in certain conversations with our with our clients and our partners. So how does that break down to the individual, the client, uh, the, 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 I'm sorry, the creative, maybe the creative director, like how can you, how do, how can they contribute to that? Creative directors, um, they look forward to kind of reaching this point in their career that like imagining beyond that. Um, and it's, I think a lot of the idea forms around the, the notion that they're going to be leading the creative vision of the project. That's, Totally true. Yeah. Um, but there's also a responsibility to mentoring the team Ooh. and building a creative culture and being an ambassador for the studio and worrying about the success of your client's project mm -hmm. beyond the visual. I love that. And so it's understanding strategy, it's understanding business objectives, it's understanding um, management. Um, management of teams mm -hmm. and joining up with other types of teams. So it might be creative tech teams for us or it might be the visual effects team. It could be um, having a conversation between a director and a producer on a film production and just really trying to get to the grips of what they're trying mm -hmm. to do beyond what does this mean for our portfolio. Um, and that's big, le that's learning, that's real learning. Yeah. The way that I've found that that works best is not putting too many translation points between a creative director and the client. So historically what we would have done, so the, the project that kind of jumps into my mind is um, we were working on a games project. The games client was in Sweden and we were working on it here in here in London. And it was a lot of video calls and we were just, we were noticing lots of iterations going on and an unnatural amount of mm -hmm. very quick little iterations that weren't really moving the work forward in any meaningful way. And I said, I said to our creative director at the time, I think we need to understand this. I think we need to go over there and, under, and see it mm -hmm. ourselves and be close to it and understand. And it was just being there and showing them that we were willing to make that effort to be there in person 
and start to be a yes. part of the conversation within their teams, it unlocked so many things. And by the end of the day, we had just garnered all the trust that we needed for them to just say, do you know what? We know that you've got this now. Yeah. Whatever you give up. And we finaled the project in a week or so. That's beautiful. So it's like you actually unlocked potentially. You actually, they, they trusted you because of the personal interaction. Huge amount of over. trust. Huge amount mm -hmm. of trust in them seeing that we understand the problem they're trying to solve rather than yeah. looking at results and kind of iterating on details that really weren't getting yeah. it anywhere. And I think understanding mindset and culture and the business is a big part of what a creative director can do. And I think the teams here, what we try and do is remove any um, filters. So there's right. not too much account management going on between the creative director and the client. Mm -hmm. To be honest, most of the time, if we can, we'll have a creative director directly interfacing with a film director. Mm -hmm. If that's not possible, the visual effects supervisor or the production designer, right. whoever, right. whoever the kind of the main point of contact is on the project. But just removing those barriers to understanding, removing the layers of Chinese whispers that might happen on a project. Mm -hmm. It's the same with our automotive clients and our brand clients and our agency clients. Just giving responsibility to creative leadership and production leadership to be in conversation with the right people. Now, I am notoriously bad for um, getting in the way of that sometimes because it's my role to kind of foster those relationships and then hand them over so that teams can deliver on projects. Yeah. And just knowing how much I'm needed within that mix and, and because I just love being a part of it here and there and kind yeah. of noodling in. Um, yeah, so that's been that's been real learning for me as well. It's like when am I needed and when the creative director steps in or um, uh, or an exec producer or, you know, whoever's kind of taken the lead on the conversation. But, yeah, I think creative directors understanding more broader business needs, having a wider view beyond the beauty and the design of something or the story or the narrative, mm. but actually... Um, so with a film director, often the question that we'll ask is, what are you trying to say? Not in this moment in the film. Yeah. Like, why are you investing three years of your life to make this movie? Why is that happening? Like, you must have a real point to make. So if it's Denis Villeneuve on Dune or, or um, more recently Chris McQuarrie on Mission Impossible, it's like, you know, what's, what's the fundamental thing that you want to leave the audience with? Because mm -hmm. you're changing what's culture, you're adding to yeah. culture. Yeah. yeah, adding to culture. I love that, yeah. Yeah, and, and if we can understand that bit, then everything, all decisions yeah. that we're making this end are framed by that understanding. So that, that's the same, like, what's the, the business objective and that can and that be, what's the message? Like, what what do you leave, want to leave the audience with and what you said was... Yeah, with Audi laughing. and the active sphere, it's yeah. like, you know, what, what, where is this, where's this driving towards, you know, pardon the pun, like, yeah. where, 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 where's, where's the motivation for this project coming from? Um, and and they had some really smart answers for that. <laughs> yeah, hope, hopefully. <laughs> no, they did. They did. They always do. Like, if you're doing projects of this significance, yeah. there's always been a lot of consideration beforehand. There's always a deeper thought to it all. And they sometimes, because of the length of projects, you sometimes forget at moments. So it's really important to ask that question. And it's once you have that question, it's all easier, right? Now you know where you're heading Uh, what you need to do, like you can actually think, create for yourself, even a team. Yeah, I um, love that. So basically, um, and that's part of because you you build that relationship. So a creative director or a supervisor, uh, when, it come, when it comes to VFX, they are, and that's what I heard, they are also responsible for building the relationships um, to the client and actually kind of asking questions, uh, getting close to them so that the client actually trusts you, right? And then trusts you with, maybe you have an outstanding idea, maybe you want to move them outside of their comfort zone, things like that. Yeah, so so that starts really early on though. So that actually starts with our marketing. So if we're saying to the rest of the world, these are the things that we do and these are the things that we want to engage okay. with, then we encourage the right conversations to come to into territory. Oh, right, Yeah. nice. So if the right conversations are coming into territory, We're then filtering those, bidding against them, sharing how, how we work and all that sort of thing. So if the right projects are coming into territory, then our creative directors, our teams, care. 
and they come in the right things come in because of the marketing because you have you frame the conversation basically we, in the marketing yeah yeah but we we are enabling projects into the studio that we care about mm -hmm. that are important to our brand that are a shared mission for territory around the idea of frameless content and and building towards that future and if we truly care about it like get out of the way client partner because we're going to care about this more than you because we now have a shared agenda and when the directors or the product designers or whoever it is that we're working with see that we care more than they do like whoa okay oh yes I, I, like now i'm observing i'm not leading this conversation yeah. i want to see i want you to be a part of our team now yeah this is interesting so so i think passion has always been a big part of us yeah. we, you know it's I've, i've always said if you're going to have a creative profession make sure you're doing what you enjoy doing and make sure that you care about it but you need to be clear about what you care about so this caring actually builds a trust for the client to be led by you yeah that, okay. yeah i i want them to feel as though we care more than they do what about the success of this work that's that's okay. what should be going on tell me more about because if, if you say care okay obviously the picture should be nice right but what's beyond that the, what, what does care well that's so surface that's yeah. so surface so normally like i said on a film production or you know a, a design project more generally so working with nike at the moment they're building out the future like the stuff that they're doing with gaming partnerships and virtual products and they've kind of shed the metaverse term now but it's like forget metaverse yes okay that was a that was a moment in time but we are we are finding new um new ways to engage with culture that are very relevant to our brands and territory have been on that journey with them now for about two or three years and every time we talk to them about it we it just feels like we're part of their mission yeah um and that you know that comes through in all the work that we do it's like yes it needs to be beautifully crafted because there's wonderful ideas here and if you if you can't execute those wonderful ideas those wonderful ideas won't get through you know if, and if you can't yeah uh, if, if you, you can't, can't execute them. i yeah. mean if you can't execute mm. then and so that's always been our thing is it you can't let a great idea fall by the wayside because you haven't executed well mm -hmm. um the, the the craft the um the delivery you know you can't shirk technology it it comes hand in and I, and i am almost getting to the point where i don't like to hear that technology isn't the creative bit technology is still the creative bit it's all the same when somebody is programming they are building something mm -hmm. from scratch using yeah. code it's a very similar mindset um and i'm i'm starting to realize that that barrier between oh no this is the creative this is the design and the blah blah and then this is the delivery and the engineering so i don't think that's useful it, it's lazy just doing beautiful design work like oh, research right. your subject research your subject understand so something like the martian or another film like that you're deep diving into how nasa works you're understanding how they're using that data why they're using that data how can that be used in storytelling to move the story forward being smart and and informed about the material you're designing for will often mean that you come at it with an original response by the way ai can't do this not yet not yet well i don't think it'll ever be able to do it designing under context I think is is a really hard yeah, thing to but you're worrying me saying that. Um <laughs> uh I think smart design is like it's like a it's a really important yeah. thing and and a, and a research phase or an understanding of what you're designing for is so critical to that. David, thanks for your time. I want to be really respectful of your time. Um I want to come again some other day. Episode three. Uh, what's that? Version three. Version three. Yeah. Exactly. So thanks for your time. Um was amazing as always and yeah. Thank, Thank you. you Marco, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Marco Fun and I hope to see you all again on our next show where we unfold creative business minds. <laughs>